Thank you very much. Are we on? Yep. And we do have, before you get started, there are some lunch and snacks for light lunch. Grab some now or during the presentation or afterwards if there's any left. Okay, so thank you for attending. Uh, Scott had uh, reached out to me and asked me to present to you today in regards to the Crystal Lagoon proposed project. I'm Art Tolis, I'm on the town council, and I'm gonna go over some history of how we've gotten here in regards to this conversation and hopefully educate you as much as possible on where we are right now. And before we begin, I wanna preface this presentation by first telling you this is proposed, this is not a done deal. I was just joking and I happened to say, you know, I think I'm gonna have some friends show up with, with uh, dump trucks and backhoes at the park and we're gonna put it on Fountain Hills Connection and say, get down here quick, they're starting the lagoon and I'm pretty sure they're all gonna believe it. So you have to know the facts and understand how we got here and, and what we're trying to accomplish. And one thing we've already accomplished, which I'm excited about, is community participation and discussion, and it's good. It's You need it, and it's good, and I've been in town many, many years, and uh, very rarely I have seen, now social media has come a long way, but I have not seen this much real activity and in, in, in discussion on a project for our community. So we have a vibrant community, and we're gonna find out how to make it even more vibrant. So this is the proposed recreational lagoon, Fountain Park, Park Solutions, how did we get here? When I was elected on council, I had a meeting with Mayor Kavanaugh. One of the objectives was to try to uh, review the downtown strategic plan that was voted into law, essentially in Fountain Hills, our plan in 2009. So we did that. And part of that plan, you'll see that Schwabach Partners, and uh, they were contracted, upwards of $70,000. The chamber was involved, MCO Real Estate, I believe, was involved as well. From what I've been told, this is back almost 10 years ago now. But they went in and they looked at the downtown and they determined how can we create a vibrant downtown and what are some ideas that will work that will also pull in the Fountain Park and have the connectivity with the Fountain and, and the activity down there and the businesses in the Fountain, area, in the fountain downtown area. So numerous public meetings, citizen participation, the council approved that downtown plan. Despite the economic downturn in the economy, uh, some of Swabak's recommendations have already came into fruition. The downtown and the development of a $115 million project with 400 apartment complexes, additional commercial space in the downtown area, that was all a, a close tie-in with what originally was, was uh, was proposed for that downtown. Bringing people here, bringing people into the downtown area, having a walkable district, and having people that are gonna be actually staying in the downtown area and also spending their money in the downtown area. So Swapack envisioned the Fountain Park serving as a focal point for the downtown, which included waterfront activities, restaurants, and some commercial uses. So let me explain a couple things in regards to that plan and, and our committee that we put forward and we had a number of people on the committee. Greg Gallucci was one of them. Greg owns an insurance company in town. We had Steve Callahander, who's a developer in town. The old Bashes Plaza, which is now the Recycled Home Plaza. Steve owns that entire project. He also built the Fire Rock commercial properties. He also had an interest in, in building the Peaks Fitness. He's got, a, he's, he's got a lot of development in the downtown area. We also had Bart Shea, Shea Connolly development on the committee. We had Melinda Stanton. We had Zentars Gows. We had Kat, Kathy uh, Ash, um, Ash, uh, Ashmore, Ashmore from, uh, from CPL Properties. Uh, and uh, am I missing anyone? Um, I, I, tried, I, I don't have the, the sheet in front of me of all of everyone that was there. Cecil Yates. Cecil Yates was on the committee and, and Linda Cavanaugh, town manager Grady Miller. Uh, uh, and, and we had people from Parks and Recs involved. We had a lot of people that looked at this plan and, can, and discussed how can we tie in what was in that original plan. One of the things that was in the original plan was a community pool. That was something that was discussed in this plan. Okay? So while trying to figure out how we're gonna do something with this lake and have the recreational use, Joe Hinbo is involved in the committee and Joe was really someone who was really instrumental in this 
and Joe had found this company out of Chile, which is called Crystal Lagoons. So we invited them to Fountain Hills. They came here and they walked the park. We met with the sanitary district. We met with Ron Huber. And after our meeting with Ron and went over, hey, is this something we should continue to look at? Everybody who saw this plan originally was, you know what, this is exciting. This is something that would really invigorate this park and we should look at this idea further. So that's what we did. There's been, there's been comments out there in social media, there's been comments that uh, the sanitary district was never involved from the beginning. The town staff was never involved from the beginning. That couldn't be farthest from the truth. We, our first meeting was with the sanitary district in December of 2016. So I want you to understand that. And not to say there's not challenges with all the things we, we need to want to do, because it's reclaimed water, and it's an issue in regards to the fact it's reclaimed water, and also it's, it's a, it's a uh, overflow lake that anytime the sewers back up or things of that nature, there's an overflow capacity for the lake. So there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of engineering that we need to look at. So with that, this is the original plan. So you can see from the original plan, if you look really close here, that's a boat dock in the, in the plan from 2009. So really the idea was, and when we looked at this and I looked at this, I said, well, you know, that, that uh, water is really blue. That looks like, uh, maybe, you know, maybe that means really they were envisioning we can use this as a recreational lake, right? So then we went back and we researched, well, it's non-potable water. And is there any way we can make it potable water? Is there any way we can have that? And, and really used it. Very, very costly and, and I wouldn't say impossible, but I think it's extremely expensive to do that, so that wasn't an option. But could we potentially dam off an area and use some of it for recreational? And that's where the Crystal Lagoon concept continued to come back into discussion and the idea that, well, maybe we could give this residents an amenity that is a community pool type of uh, a venue and we could also incorporate some of that original plan with the, with the Fountain Park. So that's, that's what we had discussions. Unanimously in our, in our committee, again, this is another one, uh, really no different, but you can see the rest of this park, they had all kinds of development. In this area here, this, is a, this was slated for an actual entrance from the Suaro Street. So you'd walk into like a visitor center, glass, looking at the fountain area. You'd go down a level. You might have a coffee shop. You might have a wine bar. You'd have some sort of an additional restaurant amenity for people to use. And then in, in our discussions and with Schwabach, I said, if money was no object, we'd do that now. And the lower level would be an entrance to the park that you can have connectivity with the park, you can have handicap access, and it could be beautiful. And it would really energize that park and, and allow people to get very much easier access. So that's where we were. So we contacted Crystal Lagoons, we prepared, pre, uh, prepared preliminary concepts for a recreational lagoon and fountain park, which consisted uh, which was consistent with the plan from 2009 in using that water recreationally. I will say this to you, and I said at the other uh, meeting as well, we learned recently that the permits we have for the lake do allow for paddle boating on the lake. So that was something that was an eye-opener for everybody, town manager included, that Dana, who is the new director of the sanitary district, said and we reviewed that whole permit and that said you know what that is not a, 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 a restricted use so that's something we might want to look at you can't have the fountain going off while people are in paddle boats next to it because you also can't have full immersion into that water either okay but it doesn't mean that you can't have any human contact with that water which is something that people have a misconception okay so the sanitary district water just to tell you, we have one of the best sanitary districts in the state of Arizona. This is the water that comes out of the sanitary district. So when you go down to the lake and you look at that lake water, that is not a representation of the quality of water that comes out of that lake. This water is one, one step away really from being, being water that you could have full immersion. And, in, and from my understanding, there are other states that already have legislation that allow for recreational use with with the water quality so I don't again that's that's what I've heard I don't have 
the backup factual data. We need to understand that. But right now, the statutes in the state of Arizona, you can't have full immersion with this water. But if you're walking around the park and you have the mist from the, from the, the fountain, that's not against our current permit, according to our town manager, according to Dana from the sanitary district that researched this. What is against the current permit is the fact that it, the water can't leave the perimeter of the entire park. Okay? So we irrigate with the water from the lake right now, and, and people picnic out there. People do everything that they do. We built a splash pad out there close to the fountain lake, which we, had, we got permitted for with the health department. So it's not that you can't have any contact with this water. You can't have full immersion. But the water quality, as I said, was very, very good. Yeah. We're going to hold for questions till the end, because otherwise we're going to go over. Passing around. Okay. So the, the, the work group was, was led by me. I already shared all the different members of the work, work group. Additional background, the consensus of the group, the unanimous consensus was, if it was possible, and if it was financially feasible, and if, and if we could overcome the obstacles, including the water and the, and, the, and the separation of the water, and the state parks department issues with the fact that we have previously used heritage funds for the park, and how do we overcome that? And also uh, with the sanitary district challenges, things of that nature. We all were in agreement that, hey, you know what? This would be an amazing amenity. And this could be something that could create revenue for our community, that could potentially pay for itself with the admission costs, with the concession that we have, and also with the ability for our town to really program events, special events, concerts at the park, different music venues on a beautiful beach with a beautiful background setting with the fountain and the, and the vistas we have here. We thought this would be a home run and this could be something that could create revenue that would offset what we currently use in our general fund to support all of the amenities at the park, including the upkeep and maintenance, because once that water goes into the park, the town of Fountain Hills manages that park. Santa Dip had nothing to do with it once it goes in that park. And they use all that water from the lake to irrigate the entire lake uh, surroundings, which is a problem in itself too, because the sodium content's so high in the water, so all part of these discussions on, it. number one, how do we stop the fountain mist from going outside of the park? We had a formal complaint, legitimately so, from a sanitary district board member in, in last year. Legitimate. And I don't blame him. He lives by the park. His car was getting sprayed. His houses were getting sprayed. His HOA that he was involved in was complaining. It's an issue. So it's a complaint that the town took seriously. We could be seriously fined by the state of Arizona as well as the sanitary district if we don't solve it. That's why you see that fountain has gone down. That's why you see we put wind resistance on the, the, how the fountain can go up or down. So the tallest fountain in the world, as I said in my previous presentation, it's never going to happen again. It's not going to happen again unless you have potable water at that lake. And we're not going to have potable water without significant costs, which would be far in excess. There was a study uh, that, that the sanitary district did a few years ago. It's about $15 million to put a reverse osmosis system in that would put reverse osmosis water into the fountain lake, which would bring it up to that next level, which I still don't have an understanding of whether, even at that next level, whether we'd still be able to have full immersion. It would be a much cleaner water. It would take a lot of the sodium content out. But would we still be able to use it recreationally and have human contact in the lake itself? I, don't, I still don't think that's the case, but it would be $15 million to do that. So now, some of these ideas that came up, well, if we can create something that makes money, that we can create something that pays for itself, that can pay for all of the other in park improvements, and we can do something down there that would take the money so that the general fund does not continue to get drained, and our capital improvement pro projects budget doesn't continue to get drained, that this would ultimately save the town of Fountain Hills money. It would generate a tremendous amount of tourism dollars. It would increase our sales tax revenues. And it could, and in my opinion, if it was done right, it would really energize the entire downtown area. You had a $115 million investment down there, private investment. We're not in the private investment business. We, they, they invested in that project downtown, but the town approved it. And now, if we can create the atmosphere for a business-friendly business downtown that will generate 
new opportunities for our town, restaurant business. It's all traffic counts. It's all, what is the Fountain Hills doing in the summertime? I don't know if Joe's coming that was here the other day, but, uh, but we had a restaurant uh, entrepreneur that owned many, many restaurants throughout the United States and in, in, in the Phoenix market. He came up here a few weeks ago looking at potential investment and he said, you know what? Your streets roll up and I'm gonna have a hard time making it. I'd love to do it, but have a hard time making an investment in Fountain Hills. We still want to talk to them. We still want to do everything we can to promote the business, but it's a fact. So we have to create that regional draw. We have to create that energy in the summer that's going to bring dollars here and businesses aren't going to die in Fountain Hills, which is a reputation many say down in the valley. You want to open a restaurant in Fountain Hills? You want to open a business? That's where businesses go to die. We don't want that reputation. We want the reputation of business friendly and a, and a community that supports their local business. Shop local, okay? That's a, that's a, really should be a focal point. So we, we met with the Arizona the Parks Department. Remember this conversation of what are, the real, what are the real stops in this deal? We met with the Arizona Parks Department. They told us, you know what? This concept, conceptually, yeah, that would, that would be something that we would accept. If you take any of the park area and you utilize it for commercial entities, similar to the original plan, if you looked at the original plan with Schwab back from 2009, they had commercial on Saguaro. If we ever did that, which I honestly can't see that happening, but if we ever did that, you have to take the value of the land from the park that you, that you took and you have to put it somewhere else in town in an area that has not already been designated for parks. So that's an exchange you absolutely have to do. So that was something that came up. And, and, but they overall said to us, this is a project that would be amenity, that would be a benefit, you need to have community support. If we ever did a, uh, some sort of a bond, the, the residents would have to pay for it. So we are far from this breaking ground, but we are looking at options. So this was the original preliminary plan, and this was an area that was 5.6 acres, and it was a separation, a divide here with a walking path, and this was the beachfront that was trying to get the connectivity. This was a very preliminary plan. This was not by any means, any is not the final plan. So this is what was kind of presented as an option. You had the Crystal Lagoon, the existing uh, lagoon. You had the beach, a clubhouse that would have restrooms, that would have little locker rooms for people, a boathouse with, with uh, docks over here that if you go to the Crystal Lagoon, and maybe we'll have time to show the video, but if you went there, you'd see they have paddle boating on these lakes. They have um, uh, the uh, stand-up paddle uh, boards, they call them, right? Anything that's non-motorized, but it's, but it's recreational in nature, they could, you could use it. So that was another way that we would rent this equipment, that people would come here and be able to do that. In the off, off season, you can have classes for scuba diving, you can have cl swim classes, you can have the, the, the yoga in the water, you can have senior activities with uh, seniors that use water for movement and it'll help them. This, the programming is endless in regards to what we could do. And again, capitalizing on what I said about the town, we could, we could program the town and have all kinds of entertainment on weekends. We can have midweek, maybe a jazz series. You can do all kinds of really nice quality, uh, tie in with the arts of what this community is all about and also generate money and keep people in Fountain Hills spending their money. That's the goal. So preliminary costs, again, this was so preliminary, but this is what Crystal Lagoon kind of said, uh, but 600 an acre, that would be like if somebody had a garbage dump that they're turning into a residential neighborhood now, okay? So some of them, they do that around the country. They, they, they reuse areas, okay? 600 grand, if you had to go in there and excavate, you had to go in there and clean the dirt, bring new dirt, do everything that they do. What they do now with this company is they go into areas all over the world, they build these lagoons, and then they sell housing surrounding it, and, it, and it's huge business. So they're really capitalizing on the, water, the waterfront activities as part of, the, as part of their uh, plan. Operating costs, again, 200000 annually. That was treating the water. They, they don't treat the water like a swimming pool. It's, it's, it's technology that is proprietary technology to them, and they use some sort of frequencies with radio waves. I can't even explain it, but Crystal Lagoons did a presentation at the town council in our work study, and they went through the whole thing of how they do this, and uh, it's really pretty fascinating. I encourage you to research the company. 
Uh, next steps was to contract with Applied Economics to analyze the project, uh, to contract with Swaback, who did the original plan in 2009. It was, it was a very good tie-in. They've already done a tremendous amount of, of work, including changing the location of the lagoon logistically and trying to design it so that it would really be better activated with the existing commercial. Based on the information presented, the council then, we made a decision whether to move forward or not with this preliminary study, okay? So that's what happened. There's been talk out there of how much money it cost. It cost $40,000. It didn't cost $40,000. It cost $18,500 for applied economics to work and, and to work on the feasibility study. The, the And $20,000 was contracted with Schwabach to do the redesign and come up with really dynamic plan of how this could be tied in with the park, where the best location is, working with the engineers to determine how we build this out. I can tell you right now that I'm excited to see the final plan. The jury is absolutely still out on whether this is going to happen and whether the numbers will come in and be, be worth the, the return on investment. But it's something you have to study because we are in a situation now that in year, years to follow, we very well could have shortfalls in our budget in regards to infrastructure and things that we need to do that we need to budget for, that we need to continue to put and allocate money for major issues that could, could come up in our town. So we don't want to be in a position that we're stagnant and that we're not growing and that our sales tax base is not growing. And also the, the uh, state trust land, that's still an unknown. You have to get a developer to go out there and do a development out there. If we don't get the right developer out there, we, we, the right product mix, we, do, we, and I say we, I ran on a platform that I want this town to be a, a community that is a balanced community. Okay? Our average age in this community has continued to go up one year every year for like 17 years. Our average age right now is 58 from what my last report was. Okay? If it continue to go up, We've got a real challenge. The school district has a challenge with enrollment numbers. We have a challenge with housing in this town, affordability factors. And then you talk about some of these other proposals, which would be a primary property tax initiative again, which is voted down many times in this town. So these are ideas that come up to say, how are we going to pr promote something that might increase our tourism, not might, it better have a real good argument that it will and that the sales tax revenues that come in from, from generating the traffic counts and the businesses on the avenue that we can increase that sales tax revenues and hopefully offset some of these long-term issues. So project update, we, we're, in the, we're in this study. This study is already going, we've got, we've, we've got so many hours into this, $400 an hour, $400 a day, I, no, $400 a, a month is what my salary is as a town council member, okay? I do this because I love this community, and I do these meetings, and I meet with these developers, and I do anything I can to promote this town. And it's not about the money to me. It's about coming up with solutions that we have to look at. Nobody's going to agree on everything, so I understand that. But let's get the facts, and let's get the financials, and let's get all the background information so that we can have an educated discussion on whether or not this could be a solution for us long term. So right now the size of the lagoon has changed, the beach area design, right now there's a design that I've seen, I don't know if it'll be the final one with Schwabach, but it holds about 3,700 people on the beach, and, and it's in the, if you saw the map, it's down towards more of the commercial area, and it's, and it's hidden so that the serenity of the rest of the park stays very, very calm, and it's still the peaceful park that we all love. The uh, separation from the existing lake is recommended to be 500 feet from the fountain in any direction so that the berm that would be built between the lagoon and the existing lake would be thick enough and wide enough that you can have a path that you'd follow the path all the way around the rest of the lake. Okay, So the separation of water would be very, very clear. Uh, addressing the birds, you know it's funny, It's <laughs> I like Humor, believe it or not, I did stand-up comedy at one time. I had a huge, huge crowd. It was pretty funny. I love to do that more than politics, but trust me, it's fun. And you know, I said uh, there were some comments about the birds. How are you gonna sell the birds? How are you gonna sell the birds? They're pooping everywhere. They're all over the park. They are. 
And it's pretty disgusting when you walk down there and you see all this all over the, the park and the grass and, you know, go down and play Frisbee and you got to sanitize your shoes when you come home because it's a mess. Well, I personally looked at some options and did some research and I found that the Phoenician Resort in Phoenix uses falcons. And it works. And it's not something that is, as some on the social media would say, uh, they're going to kill everything you've got down there. And I just heard recently on social media that at one point we drugged the birds. I don't know if that's true or not, but it's true. It, it, it's, true? it's incredible. I heard, I heard. And then they would net them and haul them away. So incredible. <laughs> incredible. Good pictures. I heard, I heard it. I heard as I was reading that they did drug the birds, but they missed one and he drowned, but they got most of them and they brought him to Salt River and the stories are incredible. So, but they're back and the Falcons might be a solution. So, uh, I'm not in favor of killing wildlife, but I am in favor of having a clean, clean park that when people come up to Fountain Hills and they say, that is one of the most beautiful parks that I've ever been to, and they see the fountain going off on a regular basis, maybe not with three pumps, but they see the fountain, it'd be nice to be going off on a regular basis. So again, to reiterate, this is not going to happen unless we can show the return on investment is strong enough, it's going to pay for itself, that the capital improvements or the, the, the capital it would need to initiate this project can be justified in, in our current budget, but it would not be an ongoing continued cost basis and that it could pay for itself. Those numbers have to be analyzed by professionals. No one in this town, including me, is going to listen to anybody on our current staff and say, well, you did the analysis on this and we're going to believe this. It, we don't have the time, resources to do it. So you have to outsource some things. I'm not a big proponent of outsourcing what you can do in-house. This is a huge, huge project that we need experts that have done projects all over the country that can work with us to try to come up with whether or not it's worth the investment. Here's a similar project in California, which is a similar potential design for our Fountain Park. You can see the southern part of our park, okay? And you can see where our existing commercial is, similar to this picture. This is not Fountain Park, so don't think we're putting commercial up and down in Saguaro, because that's not actually happening. So, but this is a very similar, and you can see how they have a real divide here with a walking path, and then you have the beachfront all around. So much, so much programming we can do for entertainment and amenities for our community. This is a similar design, same design, just a different angle so you can see kind of how it looks. So just envision our existing uh, Plaza Fountain side here, and then you have the connectivity to the lake with an entrance, entra entrance fees. There's going to be a separation. There's going to be something that's around this that's beautiful, that's not a chain link fence, that's something that met, fit, fits in with the landscaping, but it keeps everybody in the area where this beach is so that we can monitor it, we can, we can charge admission, you have your wristband or whatever the case may be, you, you have food and beverage in there, and we have a third party, not the town, running the food and beverage. Okay? We may have, and there's been discussions, and you'll see in the final report, that our parks and recs could have offices down here so that they're doing the programming from this area and that they are also monitoring it. And you know, there's been all kinds of talks about security down there. Incorporated with this plan, we should have security. We should also have an entire park monitoring system so that all of the pavilions we currently have, did you know that they should be charging rent for those pavilions? If you call the town and say, I'm gonna have a picnic and I'm gonna use pavilion B down on the, down on the east side of the park, great, what's your name? Here's the fee and we're, it's reserved for you. And we put a nice reserved pit thing there. The grill's ready for people to use if they want to, and it's monitored. Right now, that's not happening. So we have a free-for-all at our park. We have people coming from all over on the weekends, and it's a free-for-all. It shouldn't be that way. It still should be in sections of our park an amenity that people anywhere can come and enjoy, but this is going to be a paid to play program. And people need to understand that. Nobody's rolling in with a cooler and their own beers and their sandwiches. You're buying, the, you're buying your, your food and beverage there. You're renting the paddle boards there. You're using all of uh, the umbrellas, the cabanas. Have you ever been to Ganey Ranch? Have you ever been to Squaw Peak? Have you ever been to um, 
talking stick, all of these pools that have these cabanas, they charge big bucks for them. We do this right with the area that we have. We can also charge money for this, and it could be, in my opinion, like a four-star amenity that people come from town, love it, it's a social thing, and you have tremendous programming that people can enjoy. So there's a lot of thought that continues to go into this. We have lots, lots of challenges, so uh, just to be quick, you know, we talked about the permit, we talked about the human immersion, we talked about the tallest water fountain not going to happen anymore unless we had potable water, which we're not going to anytime soon or ever. It improvements to irrigation by, by, this is a good one, possible improvement to irrigation by pass, bypassing direct withdrawal from lake, which would allow us to treat the lake water further. So what that means is, as part of this whole plan, some of the capital cost for the lake and the improvements we can do for the lake, that this could possibly be something, and this is Dana from the Sanitary District brought this up. Right now they pull water from the existing lake to irrigate the entire, uh, entire fountain park. Well, when that water sits in the lake and it does not really move very much besides the ir ir irrigation we have currently, the salt content just keeps building up and building up as it evaporates. So if we can have a tie-in before the water gets into the lake and we can irrigate with water that's the water that you see here, the, the, the grass and the quality would be significantly better because the, the, the um, salt content and it's cleaner. It doesn't have all the rest of the garbage that, they, that accumulates in the existing lake. And then we can treat the lake further. The, the, the term, uh, well, th there's dyes you can use that you can put in the water. That's natural, that's, that's not toxic. It's, from what I understand, I mean, you don't drink it, but it, it'll turn that water into a, a, a much nicer appearance than, than the green algae type of filled water. So when I talk about changes to the fountain, I think personally, I think we need to change the fountain up a little bit. We still should have a fountain, but we also should have other mm -hmm. aer aeration mechanisms at the fountain park that will also draw people. I wanna go up to fountain park because you know what, they have a beautiful fountain, but you know what? On, on Wednesday nights and on the weekends, they have this fountain spray that goes off every hour that's really beautiful. Maybe we incorporate music into it, similar to what they do at Fantasia in Disneyland or something. But we're not making Disneyland, we're making something that's a quality amenity that ties in with the arts and what the culture is of our community. And this is another one, laser shows to attract tourists. This is, this is all possible stuff. And this is things that I think that we should be forward thinking of how can we improve upon what we have and make it beautiful. So these are ideas that could happen. Our, imagine our fountain in the, in, the, in the middle and then around the fountain you have different water features that have the nice lights and it's just beautiful. And people would come out at night, they'd enjoy the, the uh, lake, they'd go out to dinner at the local restaurants, they'd spend their money up here. So it wouldn't be like the movie Vacation when Chevy Chase goes to the center, uh, uh, you know, at the Grand Canyon and it looks like, hey, this is awesome, let's go. Right? It, it's going to be, hey, this fountain is beautiful. Let's stay, let's stay another hour and see it again. Let's go over to Overtime. Let's go over to the wine bar. Let's go over to Euro. Let's go and spend some money here, get a couple of drinks, have dinner, and we'll watch it again. And everybody's excited to stay here and, and, and enjoy Fountain Hills. This is another one that, <clears throat> this is actually, I believe, Fantasia and Epcot, that they have a laser light show that they have these, these, animated figures that they can make with the lights. It's all possibility thinking that we should be, we should be exploring to try to energize our community. <laughs> now, <laughs> you got the birds, right? So I already talked to you about the solution on that, or a, at least a potential solution. Somebody posted the other day, they said, why would you use falcons when we have all these kids from the high school? Can't we hire a, a bunch of kids? They can just run around the park and they can scare the birds and you know, we can rotate them. It would create jobs. I said, great, organize that. Set that up for me. I don't know, but Cross you know. Cross-country training. Huh? Cross-country training. Cross-country training, yeah. So that's an idea. That there is, so there are, there are companies out there. This isn't so far-fetched. Falcon Force, it's a company out there. You can Google them. You can look at the information. I, you know, from what I understand, they're not, the Falcons don't come in, and it's not, it's not uh, you know, carnivorism, and all of a sudden everything, right, right. you know, the foot feathers are everywhere, and I, I don't think that's what no, happens. the birds are actually afraid of them. They're so afraid of they them, and they go, back. and they don't come back, right? No. So that's an option. And then, uh, go ahead. 
So, and you know, it was interesting when, when we're looking at this and I thought to myself, the Falcon yeah. is the school mascot. Yeah. And the reason why we're talking about all these things is because we want to generate energy for our community. We want to encourage families to move up here, have an amenity that everyone can enjoy. You know, sometimes some seniors I've seen post, we don't want this in our town. I, I hope that if we're able to prove this makes sense, that we have so much senior programming at this lagoon in regards to water exercises and all kinds of social gatherings for seniors. I think it would be a huge fun for them and I think it would be great for our community for people to get out of their houses and socialize. My mother and father-in-law li live in a community in California, very similar to, to Arizona, Corona, California. It's a gated community. They have a beautiful clubhouse. They have more activities at their community pool, and the seniors are out there in force. They have, they have neighborhood parties that they start there and they end at the community pool, and it's like the movie Cocoon. It's like the fountain of youth, okay? That's what would be awesome for Fountain Hills, for everybody to enjoy this. So, uh, in conclusion, uh, you know, let's work together to solve our town's problems and, and, and come up with ideas. Okay? Don't kill me because I came up with the idea. Come up with more ideas. If this was a, if you hate this idea, come up with some more ideas because we have a lack of ideas and, and we need ideas, but this is something that might work. Increase tourism income tax, encourage continued investment, promote our town as family friendly and, and have a diverse population so our school district thrives. Everyone in our community enjoys living here and spends their money here and we have all right all ships rise and we can solve these financial challenges for the future of our town so thank you for listening and i'll be happy to take any questions okay no well i guess two comments um the swabach plan i mean i was obviously there covered it you know saw it happen and at the time, I mean, it was to me kind of pie in the sky almost because, you know, the parameters are like, well, don't pay attention to the zoning that's there. Don't pay attention to buildings that already exist. You know, the general plan that's set, you know, just dream, vision. So that, that's what we got. So I'm mean, going to get you, you know, kind of dovetailing on that. But, you know, they had a movie theater complex, you know, sitting right here and, you know, bulldozing the chamber building and, and all that stuff along, you know, so I'm just saying that's that's kind of what, what that is. I'm not sure if that's a good barometer of where the town really wants to go. And secondly, that water, it says micro filtration. So I think that's the water coming from the second treatment plant down on Qantas Drive. It's not the one coming out of Which the, is what fills the lake. Well, I, I, you know, that's the water they put in the ground in the aquifer, but I, you know, maybe it's going to the lake. I'm, you know. That's but, directly from Dana. She handed but, me that and said, "This is the water that comes with goes into the from, lake." It's from the secondary treatment plant, not which, the which is first what goes in the lake, okay. according to Dana. Yeah, right. Yeah. How about parking? Where are all these 3,700 bodies supposed to park when they're at the beach? So, great question, and something <laughs> that we're addressing. A couple of discussion points that have already taken place is plot 208 and working with a public-private partnership plot 208 there's there's uh, significant parking behind the overtime all the way up to la montana that's all plot 208 and it's also on the other side of parkview and all of the parking that's behind fills going all the way up to to uh to la montana so that's potential parking I've brought up the concept of even maybe having overflow parking and working in a partnership with the school district and on weekends if we had a big business that you'd shuttle people back and forth, the school district can charge for parking and help to offset some of their budget issues that they have as a district and we can shuttle people back and forth. There's also parking on uh, off street parking on Palisades coming up and down. There's also off street parking the same that we have when we have the art fair. You see that's 200,000 people that come in for the art fair. Not, I don't think everybody at the same time, mm -hmm. but it's significant parking. In, in one of the things that continues to come up in these discussions is if we get to that point and we have a parking issue, that's a good parking <laughs> issue to have. And, and if we can solve it in the first year or two by having some also a partnership potentially with the Lexington Inn and having the Lexington Inn build a parking facility that the town and, the, and, and, and uh, Lexington Inn cooperate with. Mm -hmm. 
We've all also talked to Bart Shea with Shea Connolly, and there's a third phase of his project that might be used for parking initially until that third phase is ready to be built. But he also has significant parking, according to what he said, that could be available for the use as well. So great problem to have if we get there. And uh, I think the businesses would really appreciate having all that vitality too. What happens in the winter months when the water's cold? Great question. So in the winter months, how can you activate this? Okay, You can activate it by having all kinds of water activities that people you still use, such as scuba diving lessons, okay? such as all of the water sports that people wear when they go to the ocean and they're, and they're, and they're, and they're surfing and they have body suits on. We could rent the body suits for people. We can still have it. And you think, talk to somebody from Minnesota coming here in January. You know who doesn't want to go in the water in January? Me. I don't want to go in the water in January. Me either. Okay, but somebody from Minnesota might, and they probably will, and they'll probably be splashing out there like the Polar Bear Club, and they'll love it, right? Okay? But the other thing, too, is don't think necessarily just the lagoon, because all of this beach area and all of the activity area, the town will have programming that continuously brings people just like if you go to Epcot, or just like you go to you go to Disney. I don't, remember the uh, the child got eaten by the alligator a few years ago. Remember they had a wedding on a beach and the alligator. Uh, on, you know, okay, everybody remembers that. It was in Florida. It was in Florida. Yeah, yeah. It, you know, we're not gonna have alligators in this lagoon. People think lagoon, and they're thinking lagoon. If you're from if you're from uh, Louisiana and somebody says lagoon, you're thinking of a swing and you're going in into the lily pads. That's not what this is gonna be. And this is going to be a beautiful area with the with the beach that we can activate that we're still generating revenue we're still generating revenue and if people want to go on that little with the paddle boats and they want to do the water activities and have the wetsuit if they need the wetsuit i think it'll still be used maybe not as much but it'll still be used but we still will have tremendous programming that makes money that's the idea sure okay the Fountain overspray must be contained within the park. Am I correct? The, the park. The yes. The Not park. the lake, the park. Yes. Right. How do you keep the overspray from going into the crystal clear water in the lagoon? This, this is a question that is continuously coming up. And one of the issues with the fountain when it goes too high is that the overspray, and this was one of the design changes because the overspray goes according to the research that's been done, it typically goes north. And, it, 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 and when it's really high, it typically goes north. The winds could go either direction. But the fountain, in my opinion, the trade-off to have the lagoon utilized, making money for our community, and redesigning what Fountain Park is, and re-imaging our town, I, I'm not opposed to that, and if we don't if we don't have the tallest fountain in the world anymore, but we have an incredibly clean park that has beautiful fountains, mm -hmm. I'm okay with that, and I'm okay with once a year Fountain Hills blows that thing off as high as it possibly can. You get permission from all the neighbors, you get permission from the state of Arizona that you can do it one time or something. I don't know, and it becomes the event of the year, and, and people come to Fountain Hills, and they, because. That day, it's going off as high as it's going to go. And everybody comes to see it, and now you've really created something that's unique. Because right now, we've lost that uniqueness. We have lost that uniqueness, we have lost that tourism draw, and we have got to do something to bring this community into the next generation of what Fountain Hills is all about. That's my opinion. And the people can vote on it, but that's my thoughts. Bo, thank you for your time. Any time Hold for on. more questions? Or? I, was say, I think we have time for one more question. Yeah, well, it's, it's my, it's my we, we can continue on. If people want to stay, feel free to leave. If, if uh, your lunch hours or business drives you back. From the meetings I've been in, and you've been in them as well, this water can be temperature controlled if we so elect to do that, or the town elects to do that. So the whole lagoon can be heated. And, and control control what cost. There is, there, there is right. a cost to that. I said, if you want to do that, there's a cost to that. It could be solar panels. It could be incorporating with 
the, the generators from the fountain. They're, the technology that they have is pretty significant. But we can look at that and we can explore those options and uh, we'll see where it goes. They have many projects that way right now. Scott. I know it's hard to estimate, but how profitable do you think this could be? I mean, you keep saying cover, cover your cost, but it seems to me that this could actually be a, a great new revenue stream for the town. But I, I, and that's what, that's what a number of very, very smart people have already felt, that this could be an incredible gen money gener gener generating amenity. When I say cover costs, remember what I mean by that. What I mean by that is you are now offsetting the general funds of this town of Fountain Hills that is paying for all of the upkeep, all of the capital improvements, and everything that happens at that fountain park. If we can create the slot machine, so to speak, you know, analogy, if you can create the amenity that people are paying to get into, that pays for the staffing, pays for the insurance, pays for the upkeep, and pays for other necessary improvements to the park, that is a dollar for dollar taking from the general fund mm -hmm. and you are utilizing OPM, other people's money, and paying for it, okay? That, that helps our, our general funds, that helps the town's budget, and also that sales tax revenue that is generated from all the other activities around the downtown and other businesses in town, that could be substantial. So that's why we're doing this very professional study to determine what could that look like. And if, it, and if it looks really good and the town council is convinced of it, which I'll tell you, it, it, it's gonna take some convincing and it's gonna have to, even on my part, this is a big investment and we all have to, to really feel really good that this is a, something that could work. But if it's something that is proven by experts that this really could be something that's dynamic, could add a lot of value, now it's going to be up to the council to put it to the voters to pass some sort of a potential bond to do this. We'll all have our say at that time. And it's, what, it's up to the voters whether or not we could ultimately do this. Yes? It would be too early to tell, but uh, do you do people foresee a fee structure? Residents get a break? Mm -hmm. Yeah, great, great question. It, it, yes, yes, driving? yes, yes. State Parks Arizona, when we met with them, they told us if this is going to be a, a, a fee amenity, that the statutes, what they had indicated, I haven't read it, I, I've listened to the people that know, and I, and I rely on their expertise, okay? Mm -hmm. I didn't verify it, but Grady was at the meeting, and so was our town attorney. And they said, you can legally charge double what you charge a resident for the same amenity. Mm -hmm. So what I envision is that this would be a membership type of event or a daily fee type of a of, a, of a amenity, and that uh, you know I'll throw a number out there. Let's say it was four hundred dollars a year for a family membership at this, okay? And you had two thousand families that joined. I don't know what the numbers are, but let's just you know th those numbers mm -hmm. on a preliminary basis start to make a lot of sense, and it starts to really starts to pay for itself, it, according to the big picture numbers of what we believe. Now when you bond for something like this, it's long-term bonding, okay? It's like buying a house. It's like, you know, and it's a pre, and, and then your amenity, you hope, pays you dividends, the return on investment. Mm -hmm. That's, those are all the numbers we have got to analyze so people have the facts. Yes? Hey, hey Scott Lenard, I, I'm, what I'm struggling with is trying to get my head around, you know, how are, what is the big attraction about a lagoon? Why are people going to drive all the way up here, pay to get in so that they can get in this water? I, I don't really get that. Two things on that. Number one, it's not just the lagoon. It's the beautification of the park that creates that beach atmosphere that you have tremendous programming at the beach. So will people drive up here for an arts festival that's, that's, that's incorporated into the beach? Will they drive up here for a jazz festival that's incorporated into the beach? Will they drive up here for a luau party with uh, Hawaiian dancers and fire shows? They will come to an event. They will come to something that's an experience. Right now, what people pay for are experiences. But I, all I, the studies I, they, I, they talk I, about. I agree with that, but what's to, what keeps us from having those kinds of events now? We already have a water feature. We have a lake. 
why can't we do all those those things without having to have water that people can get into? Well, it's a it's a fair argument. One of the one of the benefits of building a complex like this is that it will already be fenced in. It'll already be secured so that you can have the concessions at the event that we can control it. And that if you were to have events on a on a, on a weekend basis here, right now you have to pay for the fencing. You have to fence off the entire park whenever you have an event. You have to have the, the, the security. The security changes when you have an event that you have to have all the all of the fencing and you have security over here, you have security over here. There's a there's a lot of streamlining that we can do by building a facility that's already structured that can hold thirty seven hundred people that we don't have to put the fencing up every time. That we can rent the entire beach lagoon out to a to to an entity that wants to have an event and they can allow weddings, bar mitzvahs, birthday parties. I mean, you, you, it's endless of all the things that potentially could rent this beach out for an event. Yes. Either one. Which? Okay. All right. Let's say the study comes out. Everything. We're going to a boat. We're going to. What is the? You know, are we looking at 2018? And then this is what I think is going to happen, Sharon, and this is a really big process. Right now, we have hired this company, and, and Grady Miller has paid for it out of his already budgeted funds that he can utilize for what he chooses is, is necessary and what he feels could be a benefit to the town. So the town council did not vote and say, we're going to allocate 40 grand. Right. What we did was we said uh, we had the consensus of that evening that, you know what, this is worth at least some further study. Grady hired the Applied Economics Company and he hired Schwab back to, to, to the two of them to work together to do this. The, my understanding is the original, and Greg, you've been in these meetings, you tell me if any different. If the original, when the study comes out in October, we're going to have a pretty high level, but detailed, but higher level analysis of conceptually do the numbers look like they work and at that point the council is going to have to decide okay it's it's like if you're building a, let's say you're building a multi-million dollar house in, in fire rock you hire the architect the architect comes back with these great plans he says you know what these <coughs> these are the numbers i think you can build this for 3.2 million dollars okay now you say to yourself now you already own the land now you say to yourself okay 3.2 million dollars you know what if the numbers were there this is my budget and, and this is what I anticipated this is what I believe the value will be when I'm what after I'm done building right so then you say you know what I'm gonna spend the extra money because now I'm gonna have a complete detailed cost breakdown of everything so I can really nail it down I think what's gonna happen in October is if this original plan comes together and it looks like you know what guys this is something that's viable, and we really should now get the Crystal Lagoon Company out here. We're gonna we're gonna survey that whole area. We're gonna get the excavating numbers to the penny. We're gonna get every single thing it's gonna cost, and come back to us with everything. So let's say that happens and it comes back in early 2018, and now everybody sees this October and says, you know what? Wow, this really could save the town money. This could really vitalize the downtown. This is something that is something we should really continue to look at. The town council feels strong enough to take the next step. The next step will be spending more money to get that all the contract, everybody together to really get those numbers down. When we nail those numbers down, let's say it happened early 2018, now the council has to decide how are we going to pay for it? And it's very likely that it's going to be above and beyond what our capital improvement projects budgets would be in any given year so we're going to have to go to the voters but now the voters are going to have very detailed analysis of this which will include the parking study which will include every cost associated with this it will include the programming that the town believes that they're going to be able to put into this facility to continue to generate the tourism and also the amenity and the quality of life that people in fountain hills want so, lot to right. go. But, but the question is, bottom line, it probably, if let's all go, won't be put to the voters 
I think until the election in the fall of 2018. Correct. Yeah, I would think that's probably the earliest. Probably right. 2019, I would. So at the earliest, probably in that time frame. Yeah. And if it was passed, then 2019, you can see that we would actually be starting this project. And then what what kind of time frame have they given you? In other words, to build it. What are we? We're looking at 2000. When's the grand opening? 22, 23. <laughs> <laughs> If it's approved, if it's approved in November 2018, and you break ground, how soon can you break ground? How soon will it be over? Right. I don't know the exact answer on that. Do not know. But I, but in my own thought process, once it was approved, and the town had approval to proceed, and the bonds, essentially the bond initiative had had been passed, and we ultimately proceed with a bond offering. Right. Sometime in 2019, I can anticipate that we'd be starting this project and time frame to finish it. I yeah. don't know exactly, but yeah, I would hope it would be very quick. We haven't even got there. No. Yeah. yeah we haven't even got to that. It, she's saying hypothetically. Yeah. Yeah. Any further? Yes. Has there? You're talking about the cost of the town through a bond or whatever. Has there been anybody even considering the possibility of just? trying to get a private company to defray that cost or take all the costs and give them a share, a large share of the revenue before having to approve a big bond proposal or something? Yeah, all, all of those ideas are being discussed. Cecil Yates, who's a council member who's also in the commercial development business, has talked about that, having a real private-public partnership. So personally, I'd love to see Fort McDowell tie in yeah. with us. I think Fort McDowell would be an amazing partner, and I think that the tourism and, and the connectivity with the fort and the casino would be dynamic partnership. So I'd love to see them involved in the discussions. I am having a meeting with the rest of our council in November with the tribal council, and I hope to bring some an idea like this up to them and see how they'd like to work it. Sponsorship for the whole lagoon, and, and really something that would be a money maker, name branding, and a partnership that could work. That's a great question. Art? Yes. Yeah, a lot of my questions are answered there. Um, has there been a study of uh, the amount of people that the fountain brings in and out that goes off every hour? I'm not aware of any study of that. Just, uh, just listening to you, you know, the one thing it seems like it's getting at if a lagoon, you know, goes forward, it sounds like something has to be done with the fountain, either go down even further, or like you said, maybe not go off at all. Maybe once a year have a big celebration type thing. I think you know, it's, it, it's, it will go off. It's fountain Hills, it's just oh, make sure that yeah. that's... Uh, I'm, yeah. I'm not in favor of removing the fountain altogether. Yeah. I am in favor of a, a re-engineering, redesign, utilizing all three of the engines we have and creating other, other uh, fountain amenities that would beautify the entire park. It would help to irrigate that water continuously. One of the things that I found when I was campaigning, and I walked that whole area, I met a lot of people, Number one complaint from everybody, do something about that lake and do something about the smell and do something about the quality of the grass and, and it really needs to be a beautiful centerpiece of our town. And that was absolutely one of the first things I did when I came on council. So we have fixed this. We spent 200 plus thousand dollars. It wasn't because of necessarily my initiative, but I was 